just going to start by uh, introducing the program. So um, welcome to Yale Center for British Arts online series at home artists in conversation. I'm Sally Tallon. I'm president and executive director of the Queen's Museum in New York, and I'm utterly delighted to welcome the wonderful artist Anthea Hamilton to the program today. It's my great pleasure to be able to have a conversation with her. So thank you, Yale, for inviting us both here. Um, I have a few housekeeping notes. So before we begin, um, please note the program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted, which will remain so throughout the program. Uh, we'll be using the Q&A feature located on the navigation bar to gather your questions for Anthea, and they'll be answered at the end of the program. But feel free to submit your questions and comments at any time. Uh, also, if you would like to use closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking on the icon on your navigation bar. Right, so um, it's important for us to be able to acknowledge where we are and the land that we're on. And we had a conversation ahead of this webinar because I think it's tricky to know how to do that when we're in digital space. Um, we made the decision to use Yale University's land acknowledgement. And so I'm going to read that. Um, I've added a few thoughts at the end as well. Uh, but maybe you can also think about the land that you're on. And uh, if you want to type into the Q&A or the chat the names of, um, of, of the um, stewards of that land, we would be happy. We would be happy to see that. OK, so Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket, Peacock, Eastern Peacock, Sachicoke, Golden Hill, Padraigesset, Nihantic, and Quinnipiac, and other Algon Quick speaking people have stewarded through generations the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. Yale honors and respects the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations on this land. I'm just going to add part of the Queen's Museum acknowledgement here. Um, we recognize the ongoing impacts of the violent colonial displacement of native people, as well as the displacement of animal relatives and the disruption of natural ecosystems by the United States. We invite our communities to join us in taking action now by devoting time to taking care of the land, whether that's cleaning up your local park or donating to an indigenous led advocacy group. So thank you for that. Now, Anthea, born in London, uh, Anthea Hamilton is a British artist known for creating large scale installations and surreal artworks. Uh, her practice encompasses film, installation, performance and sculpture and her work is frequently site specific. Her approach combines archival study, popular culture, scientific research. She pulls together resonant images and objects and conversations and collaboration are key to the way in which she works. In 2016, she was shortlisted for the Turner Prize, and in 2019, her work was presented as part of the 58th Venice Biennale. Um, Hamilton's work has been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions around the world, and her work is in major collections worldwide. She lives and works in London. And welcome, Anthea. Hi, um, <laughs> hi. so um, we're going to start uh, with a question about um, I was really interested to understand, like, how did you decide or how did you become an artist? And can you share a little bit about your journey and the support structures that enabled you to make the choice to study art? Um, yeah, of course. I um, grew up in London. I've not really moved very far. I'm still kind of based in the same kind of uh, borough as where I grew up. And... I think growing up in the 80s, kind of Margaret Thatcher's Britain, um, and then that becoming like a new Labour Britain as kind of I approached the kind of period of going on to study and go to university, the kind of um, options to me, the kind of the classic were to become a doctor or a lawyer. You know, <laughs> like that's the thing, like if you're going to go on and become, um, how would you say, take on a profession, then those were kind of the options for um, my kind of socioeconomic class. Um, and I neither of those really chimed with me. And I also felt like that wouldn't really be that liberating a space because I'd still be fulfilling a sense of expectation. And at that time, there seemed to be this kind of space that seemed to become a, a 
um, visible to me, which was something more creative. And I think initially I'd thought about becoming a designer or working in film or uh, advertising because I like the idea of finding visual solutions. And so I kind of kind of quite traditionally took the route of doing like my A-level art and then uh, doing an arts foundation, an undergraduate course, trying to do a few other things, including running a gallery and so on, and then going on to that. And it was very much about playing to my strengths, you know, like actually someone who followed the things that suited them as and within that of course you face a lot of resistance and a lot of friction but it was always kind of very much about like playing to my strengths um but I think in that I've always brought with me a lot of all those different types of myself like, you know the kind of multifaceted non-monolithic way of being and they're very much part of the practice um yeah. so that's kind of like a mini background I would say it's interesting though because you had that choice at that time and I think Thatcher was the big Thatcher's Britain it was the beginning of the dismantling of a lot of the support structures that enabled people to kind mm -hmm. of make choices to maybe study art or go into higher education with 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 fun, funding and support and do you think yeah. you have been able to make those same choices today? I just don't know if those choices even make sense in the same way you know like I don't know if what's studying now with all the kind of thinking around what education is in terms of like you know either in primary schools or secondary schools and then up all the way through to degree level like it seems like the framing of those have switched completely yesterday my daughter's school was on strike because the people who were meant to be teaching are just not being supported in a way that allows them to do their work and I know that's always a kind of a back and forth but it seems incredibly um, pertinent at this moment a lot of the students you speak to they're kind of working very compromised spaces I think something that I have been able to kind of establish my confidence as a maker in is that I didn't have to compromise that there was actually this kind of it's almost like the seas parted for this kind of decade or so and I was able to pass through and I don't yeah. know I mean or maybe yeah maybe because I'm I wonder if I'm resilient enough to be able to do, to do, do it all again in this time I can I'm quite a I don't know a lot of my work's about kind of a lot of tendernesses or kind of softness and ways of thinking and I'm, I don't know if I would have you know there was things that I tried to do like I thought about becoming moving moving in post-production that seemed like a proper job mm -hmm. not an artist mm -hmm. I didn't know that was an option <laughs> and I remember going to sign up for a um a post-production company and all the other people who were in the same role as me were big bros like big men huge shoulders all six foot tall and they were literally all speaking to each other eye to eye. And I was kind of like a foot below that. And I knew that that wasn't going to work for me. I thought mm -hmm. I have to find a space where the way in which I speak supports who I am, supports my ideas as well. And if that is a kind of an equivalent kind of power structure to that, I don't know how it would have been. But, but mm -hmm. this is where I am now, fortunate enough to have not had to make those decisions, not have to have not been able to make those decisions. We've afforded a lot of liberty. I mean, you have spoken about art as an escape route. And mm. I know that like you studied in Leeds as well. And like having grown up in London, that's a very different context. And, mm. um, you know, I think I know that you worked as an arts administrator, that you ran a gallery, mission gallery, that you've always been a kind of convener and organizer. And I mean, I suppose that's why film industry would appeal to be to you. But can you talk a little bit about that idea of, um, an escape route what that means and what the experience was oh and maybe go let's go back to that image because uh nobody knows what that was so like let's yeah. let's just speak <laughs> to that image because that's from that's from 1990 yeah that's a very early image and I think uh kind of interesting to see that as it as it relates to some of the threads that run through your work and continue to absolutely There's a lot of questions there I don't know which how you want to do that but like yeah escape route what is this picture and well, uh, yeah. tell us a little bit let me make some notes but I think um this work seems to kind of encapsulate everything I still think it's one of the best works that I've made I think I was 19 when I made it um so I was in the second year of my undergraduate course at Leeds uh, and I wanted to I knew always knew I always got the sense you know, it's still the kind of the dominance of London that I needed to be in London to be able to do things, but maybe there could be this kind of escape route from my family space or from London itself to see what else was out there. And so I went to what I thought was quite a rural place, but in fact was the city <laughs> of Leeds. 
Um, I'm from Leeds, you know that. So. Yeah, so yeah, I was just like, I was like, where did where did where did everybody go? Yeah, I was like, it was it was quite a culture shock for me. I think that's the thing when you grow up in a space of diversity and that is take that is removed from you, then you can suddenly realise, um, not that it's a luxury, but that it doesn't exist in the same way for everyone, and not everyone has the same lens as you for looking at things. Um, but maybe returning to this work, this is called Over the Rainbow, and it was a single channel film that was shot on VHS, not in a retro way, but that was the most kind of up to date <laughs> kind of film stock available to me at the time. And it's myself kind of to camera um, singing Over the Rainbow from uh, The Wizard of Oz. I think even then I had this interest in using um, material which was very accessible and very known to people so people could instantly relate to um, Judy Garland or that film and the ideologies in that film as much as, as easily as I could um, and it's very simple it's kind of just then stretched out I think to maybe like three double half the time so it's kind of the, the, the sound of my voice becomes quite monstrous um, mm. and then the video is inverted again it, in a very kind of very pragmatic way it's like taking this optimistic optimism and kind of like flipping it on its head so it speaks to something else and um, I think the work was amazing you know like I was 19 and I think the issue was that I had maybe a bit of a crush on someone it was not requited <laughs> and um, I was a bit sad about it but it was discussed by my tutors who also saw it as like a strong piece of work but very much through um, an identity lens mm -hmm. and thinking mm -hmm. I remember the phrase something like oh you've turned yourself into a white girl isn't that interesting and I was like well that's absolutely not what this is about mm -hmm. this is about you know boy x over there and having without being able to necessarily verbalize that at the time but understanding that myself was not seen I, I was seen through a, a lens of otherness and not mm -hmm. as myself I think it was one of the the first and last times that I necessarily appeared in the work because I had this understanding that I would not be seen on my terms through mm. institutional spaces but there's other ways in which I could play with that like rather than it it, it wasn't a retreat as much as more like a change of attack or like oh, I can use your own um codes I can use the codes that exist without there and do whatever I want with them because they're going to be misunderstood anyway so everybody can get on with however they want and then I'm very much playing with that ambiguity in the work thenceforth and maybe I always knew that anyway but it was kind of in my face for the first time in during that during that and really period. shocking and was that coming from like tutors who were a lot older who just were very limited in terms of their understanding of contemporary arts practice and 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 it, unable to talk about um you know issues of race and identity in a kind of way that they were comfortable with is was it that or I think it was also just very unfashionable at that time you know mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. like the late 90s that kind of move away from like the work that had been happening slightly earlier in the decade. I mean, what interesting mm -hmm. with this film then, um, as part of an application that I was making, it was sent to, uh, I don't know, a jury and Sonia Boyce was on that jury. Oh. And she then selected the work alongside Emma Dexter for a presentation that was at the Tate. And so, right. um, but I was aware that already like Sonia was, now it's incredible that like, she's very, you know, absolutely getting, getting all the praise that she deserves as are many other artists of the same generation. But at this time when this work was happening, there was that kind of complete shift towards the hyper, hyper success, hyper success of the YBAs and, yeah. and politics or laddishness and blokiness exist being dominant and that. But in the what? market dominating, there was a big shift yeah. from the like eighties into the nineties, mm -hmm. where we'd had such amazing feminist practice. There was so so much diversity in terms of artists and conversations, and then that was kind of crushed by this moment of uh, in the in the nineties, exactly this moment. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's changing. But people have had to wait far too long to be seen, in my opinion, in, in these conversations. But. Um, Thank you for sharing that really early work with us. I think that's helpful. Um, it does lead us into the next slide really nicely, actually. So outsourcing images of yourself to someone else that you found. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, yeah, I work? guess it also kind of speaks to that idea of, um, how would you say, like doing slightly the wrong thing. I think I've never truly understood like 
for how to do so the rules of things and so this was on like a first this work is a series of postcards of John Travolta and um I got them it was like a college trip to New York it was like the first time in the city they'd set the itinerary and I think we were meant to, we were meant to be going to the Guggenheim and myself and my friend decided to ditch that idea and really to kind of see another type of New York rather than going into the institution we went probably wasn't downtown it's probably Broadway it's probably and absolutely the most kind of <laughs> touristic part of the equivalent of going to Trafalgar Square and but we ended up in a kind of a thrift store and we each bought a John Travolta postcard book and so this work is not at all you know I think he's an interesting figure this idea of someone who's kind of brought to visibility and becomes very successful because of their physicality or they kind of fitting within a sense of the classical um which is maybe why I held on to it as like an object of curiosity. But for me, what this, the appearance of these kind of pieces of paper in this kind of leg chair, semi autobiographical kind of shape speaks to um, doing the wrong thing or being elsewhere or remembering that that's a strategy as well within a practice. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I, I did that trip in 1999 and then kept those images with me not in a sentimental way but out of a kind of a sense that there was something kind of pertinent to them and and this work was made I don't know what you say like 10 10 12 years later so I can mm -hmm. I can be very patient with things kind of wait for them to kind of make sense to mm -hmm. me and this was kind of a part of an ongoing series of pieces and what I mean it's interesting because he does reappear in your work John uh, Travolta and um, and so um what is it about him that what does he symbolize and um what does he represent for you I mean you know yeah, I think it's explicitly what, yeah what, yeah what he does I think I mean he was well the two big films he was in to my understanding of him were Greece and mm -hmm. Saturday Night Fever and Saturday mm -hmm. Night Fever was especially interesting to me as this kind of cultural object that was very it seemed to be slightly before my time so it's also I'm looking at it in a historic way but um this film that was meant to be about disco culture or about like how amazing disco was but um now it's great that there's a more understanding that the whole disco scene or the whole kind of was a very much an alternative scene it was a space a safe space for black queer latinx communities to kind of come together and I think it was also an interesting moment that that was put into play at the same time that a culture of recycling was established within society before, mm. you know, you wouldn't, you know, like the 70s, you think about those looks, it's actually something from the 30s mixed with something from mm -hmm. the 40s, mixed with something from, I don't know, Tudor time. So there's this kind of idea of culture starting to recycle itself. Now it happens in these kind of incredibly fast cycles, but it was the first time of that. And also technologically, you would have things like synthesizers, which were made in such a way that people could then make a variety of types of sounds and then you think in a geopolitical way it was kind of I don't know like where do people get to live who are they put next to where are they excluded from like that's actually kind of the geographic kind of quality of the disco scene and then all of that getting completely carpeted over by the appearance of John Travolta and his kind of pretty face and it is a very pretty face and that's why <laughs> it's so successful and I think it's kind of everything that he um disallows or his image is disallowed as this kind of screen or a curtain or a, a flatness over everything else um and maybe it took me what you know took me from being 19 to much later to understand that but mm -hmm. yeah it makes me question all the things that I liked when I was growing up or why I wanted to be an artist or what that escape route um signified and why I chose that like what what was I actually interested in like what was what were my goals and are they accurate or was I seduced by other things as well yeah. I mean, I think that's interesting because you you already at very early stage were like not just looking at the visual arts, but very much looking at fashion and film and thinking about different disciplines and also the, you know, in a way, of course, the kind of wider socio-political context, how popular culture sort of folds in to create images. Yes, and that leads beautifully to this image um, of Carl another one another another man mm. that you're taking in and and uh, presenting in the space do you want to talk a little bit about this so this is a couple of years later right 2012 yeah but I think it was also an image that I probably um came into my I say archive like it's a lot but like I have like a small folder of images which seem really key and I, I can have that kind of patience with them so 
um, I think I had kind of um, found this from a Helmut Newton um, publication when I was studying uh, at the RCA on the painting degree, painting course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, when I was thinking about this piece of work, which was actually first proposed to be like a, what do you call it? Like the do a donations box for an institution. Oh, really? Yeah, and I thought you could drop the money in somewhere and then the coins would kind of tumble down. But um, because that idea didn't go ahead, I thought, oh, we'll just put some buckwheat inside instead. It's more, it's just as nurturing to have like some buckwheat in there. We'll just put that in there. <laughs> but, um, oh, I, I like see. Wait, so that mountainy bit at the front is like a, is made of perspex or something? Yeah, it's like a, uh -huh. like an extruded uh -huh. thing like this. Yeah, yeah. And, then, uh, and, and originally it was for lots of coins for an institution yeah, yeah, yeah uh -huh. exactly folding and some yeah some change um okay yeah and that, but I, I think I, I remember seeing this coming across this image and not you know there's that kind of moment before you read the caption and you know it's Karl Lagerfeld and I guess he became such an icon the idea of like the white ponytail the collar mm -hmm. the black glass the leather and just that within that icon there exists this other kind of juicy bear like potential and so you kind of have like a a time travel between the the, the two versions of oneself and maybe that's why you know, you have these ephemeral objects, this idea of a seed or a tuber that is, it's kind of in a fixed form, but it's going elsewhere. I think I also just really like to eat those things. Like I love a Desiree potato, <laughs> I love to have some salad. It's like, why not? I, I strongly believe in like the desirability of the work or the material kind of wonder or the, sat the satisfaction of work, I think is important for me. But then I'm, I'm always kind of like tripping back to like, what does, what is satisfaction con constitutive? Con constituted from also. yeah yeah well and how images of people consumed in here like objectifying like white uh -huh. men uh in a mankini with a kind of you know in a, I think playing around with that is very interesting and I think that playfulness definitely runs through all of your work I mean um yeah. I can't remember what the next image is I think it takes us to Yes, repurposing and kind of also, I think maybe this does lead us into some of the conversations around how fashion, fabric, kind of the, you know, these images persist, but also like looking at support structures and how you've grown a kind of language that uses many different kind of surfaces and, and ways of constructing imagery. Do you want to talk a little bit about how these works came about? Yeah, I think, um, well, they were, they were around a period when I started to think about making performance. I think a lot of the work before showed potential of movement or it had bodies, mm -hmm. in, you know, the kind of potential bodies, either these legs or these photographic um, images. And um, I was looking at this idea of what kind of uh, Japanese kabuki theatre was. And with mm -hmm. that came, comes the kimono, like you don't, you don't have you don't have it without. Um, and I'd say that these works, they're not really kimonos, like they're made kind of uh, accurately, whatever that can mean for me doing that in 2012, but um, they're sculptures in the forms of kimonos, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind mm -hmm. of like vessels that take that, take that shape. And I guess I was, it, it's not it's not like I it's not just like I think kimonos are cool like yeah Japanese stuff that's cool it's not that it's more about thinking about the the kind of a consent a sense of consumption by the west especially at the end of the 19th century of um Japan and just how uh, enthralled that you would have um you'd say like the impressionists with suddenly like a complete co-opting and appropriating of, of that quality of line that kind of way like a kimono turning into a, a dressing gown a, you know like things just being cut up and becoming ornamental this kind of skewing of a culture but this object itself withstanding that with, withstanding the kind of the extractive quality that was kind of being applied to it um, and mm -hmm. so in these works, I guess it's me also understanding that you can throw, I can throw anything at it. Like I could be trying to like get my head around um, the consumption of disco culture and minorities through disco and John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever. I can think about it through my own love of food photography and what that means to 
kind of stage or kind of make a sense of a meal performative. And so they become almost, almost like, te- for me, they kind of have been like texts or like essays. I'm not very mm-hmm. much, I'm not the best kind of narrative or linear thinker. So they kind of become these kind of folding spaces that I can kind of, that generously allow me to have those, kind of make a frame for those thoughts as a, as a template. Um, yeah, and they definitely and relate of... back to that early work that you showed with the with the postcards, with the uh, you know, like there's definitely a kind of journey there. This this kind yeah. of sculptural structure, support structure, whatever you can, mm. and and the way that that relates to the space, but then this kind of image being hosted on a on a on something we recognise, but no longer it's not the same object, which I think you know, like that you've used. I don't want to say costume but you've used you've used so many times the the different kind of surfaces and 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 um, enabled us to question what we're looking at in in that space and mm-hmm. I, I can really see that here I guess I trained in painting and maybe that kind of mm-hmm. study that you do when you're staring at like a, a two-dimensional surface is still very present in the work um yeah like a the kind of the limit of the of the edge of what happens you know what's what I think something why I struggled with make myself making a painting is always like, what happens when, when if there's more to say? What happens if you actually realize <laughs> you want to do You're going to add on another text or you're going to add in like another idea and without kind of destroying everything in. I think that's why a sense of a peripheral vision became really important to me. And that's why these mm. had to be physical. They had to be like two dimensional. So they still have that kind of flatness of experience, but it's like a false flatness somehow because they're, um, I don't know. I don't know. I think you said it already. But that's no, but I think it's. I think it's. I think it's uh, important because the you never work within the single frame, and we will get to that when we talk about like both the installations, but also how on earth you capture the the kind of complexity or the layered nature of the work that you make. Um, do you want to move to the next slide? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, so I think this is perfect because here. This is a co- such a complicated work, and there's so many layers to it. It both references the architecture it's in and draws from different, um, you know, um, different aspects of your work and your research interests. But maybe, uh, and I know this was in New York, which is mm-hmm. uh, great to have seen that at the Sculpture Center. So, do you want to talk a little bit about how you came to make this work site, spe- site specifically, I suppose, in that environment, and and then we can talk about how it travelled. Yeah, so uh, this was my first kind of solo exhibition in New York, in an institutional space, and I worked with Aruba Katrib, who was an amazing curator to work with, and I think I probably paraphrased it by now, but I remember Aruba saying, like, you should do something big, the space is really big, you got any, like, ideas <laughs> or something big you want to do? And I was like, well, there's this one thing that I thought would be good, and her saying yes, and I was like, oh, shit, like, she said yes to this, like, how do you... I can't come, come down from that. Or what does it mean to say yes? Or what, what, where, do you, where else do you go from that? You can only kind of go forwards. And what else, else needs to happen in a space and with myself as a maker or the thinking around this show that kind of doesn't make this into like a ridiculous act. But I think it all seems to make sense. It's kind of a rationalized space, like any space that itself wasn't brick. I covered in brick wallpaper. There's sculptures made with bricks you know it's kind of it's kind of understanding the space on its own terms and I think um if it was I think as a British artist of my generation having a show in New York is really important it's something yeah that you know it's kind of like you know the kind of abstract expressionist like the modern the kind of modern postmodern market is definitely kind of comes from the US it doesn't necessarily come from England that's a different kind of space and so mm-hmm. it was a you know, you have to go, you have to go the whole way. Like it has to, it has to, you, you can't do it by halves. Like, you know, at the <laughs> time, you can't go half hog. You got to go whole hog. You got to just go, like go for it. I was like, okay. But no, you know, you New York, you see, you, you could see an ass every single day. You know, like it's nothing also, you know, it's it doesn't have that kind of shock and shame or prudishness that it would have in the UK. So I was also enjoying the fact that you could kind of do a different type of exhibition in New York than you could do in the UK or in, in the States than you could in the UK that it, you know no one's going to be bothered by this whereas in the, there would be a complete uproar to have done this or to kind of birth this project there 
And so that was great, the kind of the freedom or understanding your own limits by stepping out somewhere else was incredibly valuable. Um, and we reached out to, it's a, it's a, a remake of, um, and yeah. I'm talking specifically about the, the butt at the top of the room, but um, is a remake of a kind of a prototype proposal made by uh, the architect and designer Gaetano Pesce, whose work I love. He has this kind of incredible sense of materials, um, really playful, kind of um, provocative, not just in form, but also in use of materials, um, that this attitude that I really appreciate. And so it was kind of like an homage to him mm -hmm. with that. And I uh, made a point to try and meet him and to kind of get his blessing um, to kind of see- Did you I manage did. to meet him? You did? Yeah, I did. I oh, did. Great. I had a yeah. fangirl moment in his kind of studio in Broadway where yeah. I couldn't talk. Um, <laughs> I was just like, wow, I'm really here because all the things I'd seen in all the books were also around. So it was kind of this strange, um, what do you call it? When you meet a famous person, I was like starstruck by like the sofa oh. that, I, you know, it was, um, it was, it was great. Um, yeah. There's a humor to this work as well that like, do you think, I mean, I know you showed it again in Tate and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll move to that in a moment, but like, I think, um, do you think that it's read differently? It was read differently in New York than it was in the UK? Yeah, but maybe it's, um, and I couldn't say how, because I'm not a kind of a native to there. I don't think it was, it's definitely silly, but it was seen with a slightly different like take on its silliness. Mm -hmm. it maybe more like a curse, a curse word in New York. Yeah. Whereas yeah. in, you know, it was like more just like swearing, whereas like in the UK, it would have been seen as like an insult, but not, you know, like it's it's not, it's kind of, I think it's got something much more kind of Baroque in this space than it did in the mm -hmm. UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, it's less, in, uh, I don't know how to say, it's, it doesn't, um, it doesn't open itself up for judgment, open it, open yourself up, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't kind of, it's, it's just what it is, it's like, it's just, taking its own time it's not in so much of a dialogue in a way it's kind of monolithic I think it it's also a fantastic and it looks fantastic in the sculpture center it's a really great use of their space actually to activate that whole room I did not yeah. see it there I saw it in London but um I think you've got the source images after this if I remember rightly is that yeah. right yeah, yeah this is um yeah. one of the production stills which I feel is really like key because as well as the kind of the visual of it there was also I've always got this kind of underside the back back end oh the museum I really like backside work. I think you yeah, can backside, say yeah behind the scenes <laughs> to, the, to the to the work and so the work was made um Gaetano's original was made with silicon which was the most technologically advanced material and he cast uh the ass of a notable architect who was a friend of his and I thought I wanted to kind of make a parallel to that so my version is uh, 3D scanning, which was like the most up-to-date thing mm -hmm. now to do then, it's still kind of, and then, and this is like a notable New York curator who um, you would know also. So who you will not reveal, I know, no, you, no, I asked they, you before. They, yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I kind of, I made a, I made a agreement that I wouldn't discuss who it was. I think they open about who they are, but that's their business, that's not my choice, I can't say. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But I like this picture also. And then mm -hmm. uh, I can't see where my mouse is. It's strange. But then it went on mm -hmm. to be part of the Turner Prize, which has quite a different yeah. read. And it needed to be treated in a different way as well. Like we took the surround down. It was painted slightly differently. It was put in context with this kind of sky in the other part of the room. It was much more, it was more like a, I'm going to say the wrong classical sculpture, like a Bernini or something. Like I really wanted it to be like a big marble sculpture that you could appreciate yeah. it in the UK for its form rather than its ridiculousness. And is this art before anything else? There's like a slight split second where you would enter through the left of the image, what the kind of the left yeah. of the frame and see the hands mm -hmm. first, like a micro moment before you just completely, you know, confronted the ass. Um, yeah. But also, you know, like seeing it at the sculpture center, like you see it within this kind of um, brick, heavy brick building yeah. that's like a post-industrial space, whereas, within a kind of very classical architecture like Tate Britain is, this is this has a very different resonance. How was it received in as part of the Turner Prize as well? Do you think it was understood? I think, I don't know. I think, 
I made, um, I remember like waking up in the middle of the night after agreeing to be in it with this project, like, oh, you just, <laughs> some really good silly there. You just made a, like an app, literally an ass of yourself within like, within how art is perceived in the UK in this moment now, mm-hmm. like post YBA, like you've, you've messed up. And so I thought, no, I have to really support, I have to really fight for my ideas because it wasn't just about making something jokey. It was actually kind of riven with lots of other ideas. And so um, that's why I spent a lot of time thinking about where how I could use the architecture of the space. So yeah, as I said, like putting it into the middle of the room, making it like a 360 experience. It's not just this kind of flat image. Um, but what you can't see behind is that the rest of the room was like kind of a heavy minimalist brick mm-hmm. wallpaper like quite severe and then the other side was this kind of softer if we could say maybe more feminine space with these kind of metal chastity belts hanging in like I really thought about what it would mean to be in that space in the context of that exhibition I think I had with that it was great to live the work in two different ways I got to live it in a very free kind of New York way and then I got to live in a really uptight but on my home territory. So I knew I knew how it would be misunderstood. I think that's the thing you don't know how you'll be misunderstood. Well, I mean, not not just the UK context, but the Turner Prize context, which mm. is a very mm. high pressured environment in which to show your work because it's yeah. framed as a kind of competitive. And you, I mean, I th- um, you didn't leave Tate. That was the beginning of like a very long conversation yeah. with them and a lot of work you did with them. Do you want to talk a bit about how that work evolved and, and then grew into the enormous uh, work that you made that took over the um uh that was the that was the back yeah right we can oh no in. wait okay well no we can we can go to scale do you want yeah. I'm sorry I I jumped to Tate but like let's just everyone just hold that thought that Anthea did not leave Tate this is an ongoing conversation and we'll come back to that but yeah, I this think was this is interesting on the relationship to scale and architecture yeah, so I think simultaneous to the sculpture center, and I think I've often had it that way, some kind of two shows at once. So I get these kind of like, as I said at the uh, the top of the talk, this idea to express the multiplicity of myself that maybe, I, you know, if I work on two projects at once, they have a completely different kind of visual identity. So I think at the same time as the sculpture center, I was working on this for the Leon Biennial. And um, I, I was, I think we all were, the artists we were in two spaces and I, my work seemed to kind of bookend the biennial. So you had this kind of um, same kind of motif with this Akram figure, kind of a Yeti, ambiguous female, something going on um, at, in the Mac, like at the last, last or the last room mm-hmm. you got to. And then also a list to create on the external, like the very kind of final part of there. And, and I think, um, you know, working with Ralph Rugoff on this he was like do you think you can do it you think you can um take on this space I was like yeah I'll give it a go like I will do it and I think this was I wanted to convert it to feet but I can only remember it was like 25 meters long and you know it's a work that speaks to the environment or speaks to the outside of the biennial because you can't be in front of it and actually access it it's kind of an inaccessible Mm -hmm. scale Mm -hmm. um and but I think that kind of process of having to think how do you expand oneself without becoming ridiculous kind of came into the practice around then, um, which then was very much kind of brought back into um, this use of always kind of addressing the use, how to kind of hold a space or hold a site. And then all the kind of ramifications of that came forward. So this is the other end of the biennial as such. That's yeah. where kind of zooming into the space. Amazing, um, yeah. Um, I mean, this to... this this talks to your use of materials in a really interesting way as well, like the idea of fabrication and how that's evolved in your practice mm-hmm. also. I think I've always, um, as much as I love being an artist, I, I never, maybe the only reasons I can understand being an artist was this idea of being alone in one studio. I think I'm very social in that way. And I think I've always collaborated with my fellow artists and then I kind of took that next step and then started to work with people in different design, uh, different kind of cultural fields. And this was like the first kind of key one was working with um, Atelier Gemil, who were based in France to make this kind Mm -hmm. of volcano table. And I love this idea when you work with different disciplines, then the way decisions are arrived at are really different. So I've also kind of understood decision making is a material as well or that you understand like the speed of a material in a really particular way like the idea of glass you know it has a very particular behavior that you you can't you only you can only collaborate with it or work with it and then 
yeah, but I think this this sense of different speeds in the different disciplines, I find fascinating. Like the speeds of an artist is quite slow versus the speed of an institution is like oh, forever. It's like an iceberg, like melting. Or slowly. a designer, a, like some yeah. someone who's moving towards through a brief in a very different way. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think I find that vital. It's kind of like different beats that you would have in a piece of music. That's you know, it's not just this kind of drone this is kind of it's gonna it's gonna have all the different kind of things zinging to kind of make it work um this is with oh, yeah. my partner Nicholas Byrne and we have this kind of recurrent series um of inflatables and this yeah. was in the Shinko Pavilion in oh, Berlin great. and other places um mm. performing the work um and I this think this speaks to that question of space right yeah oh. yeah and also like a difficulty of I mean you, I think you probably got other things to say about it, but I think with this, this kind of speaks to a frustration that I sometimes have with the, as much as I can see that there's a successfulness in the strength of the images that I make of installations, I think then in translation, in documentation, the physicality can not be captured. So for instance, in this wallpaper, um, there's a lot of, there's quite a, a subtle fade which exists in it. So when you're in it, it feels like it's glowing, you're in the mist or you're kind of sinking into it so that body on top of it of the, the black mannequin has quite a different kind of behavior than it does just when you look at the picture so it's also yeah. then trying to use that my own kind of frustrations with that in understanding how other photos have been made like going back to a Travolta or a um, Lagerfeld image I think it's this kind of internal external Balance well, the materiality of the work and the experience of the work is, mm. is so hard to capture. I mean, like that, we talked about that quite a bit, didn't we? That I think, um, especially when the works that you make are so complicated, and also when you see the works, the way that people occupy the space is so critical to the work. So you mm -hmm. have your entourage here um, occupying the space on your behalf. But, um, you know, like what did that work look like when people interacted with it? Yeah, like as soon as a body steps into the space, mm -hmm. is it breaking it, confusing it, adding to it? I guess all of those things, and mm -hmm. that's what I'm um, planning for or anticipating with that. It's kind of like a, um, that's very much part of the practice. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that that's part of everyone's practice, but I think I mean it maybe to like a greater degree somehow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then um, here we are back, back at Tate, where you've been all this time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, it's a, a huge privilege. And I work with uh, Lindsay Young, who's an incredible curator um, and very rigorous. And I think we both started working at the Tate at the same time. I think she was, it was her first year as curator of the Turner Prize and my first time doing um, a substantial, I think I'd done an Art Now group show, but it was one of the first kind of real immersion into the institution. And it was really an immersion. And I think I kind of think about this as it was almost like doing a PhD or it's very much a case study on how a big um, like state run space functions in that way. Um, and so this work is called the squash. And I think of that as I can never remember that like a noun, like in terms of the vegetable, but also would we say a Squashing verb? as well. Yeah, uh -huh. it's like both, both right? Um, um, and maybe just some facts about it because there's a lot of facts and it was very important that it was like fact-based, but then there's all the other things which can be non-articulated. So um, the room itself is 265 feet long um, and then covered it in 7,000 tiles. Um, I selected 10 artworks from the collection, which were all kind of mid-century apart from one, which was from a Victorian sculpture. And they were all selected. Um, I looked through, yeah, 78,000 works and there were only 10 that I could use in the end, which kind of shows like what museums physically are able to support you know we looked at a lot of ephemeral works work by female artists textile works but it turned out it's bronze it's henry moore it's um mm. the sluggard it's, it's actually certain things which dominate just by nature of how those spaces are made around them it's kind of this kind of i don't know symbiotic power mm -hmm. grab that existing in those things um uh, there were there was always one performer in the space 10 till 6 but there was a pool of 14 and then there were seven looks and so it's all these like kind of numbers it was kind of like an audit on the space you know it's like how many people can how many security people do we have to have in how many breaks do we need to have how you know it was all this idea of what are all the figures that need to succeed for the work to be able to run um 
and I think it was a, it, I mean, I think it was like one of the strongest pieces that I've done, but I'd also say it was like a really exact constellation of all those numbers, but also there being support for the idea that came from like the private, the corporate and the public, this kind of like nexus of things that kind of all coalesced around the institution myself as part of it. Um, I could talk about this forever. I mean, Go through. So, I mean, let's look at the next slide so we can see because because I think there's some really great images of the um, use use and activation of the space. Yeah, by I your think, performers. Yeah, exactly. by your talent. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, the talent. Yeah, I like the idea of the talent, which is like something I've kind of co-opted from the fashion because I didn't. We when I worked with the movement director and the performers and the curator, we were very much aware that we didn't want the idea of the performers having to perform or to deliver or to do something which we consumed by the audience. The space was 100% designed for them. So this kind of big, we called this one the bed. This was like, okay, there's a space that you can go and have a sleep at the back and no one can reach you, no one can touch you. There's another space where only you have the key to get up the ladder and you can go there. All of these things, even the selection of the artworks from the collection are there to support you. Like, you know, someone can go and look at a, um, a Bernard Meadow sculpture and you can have some respite somewhere else like the whole thing was kind of geared around I don't know at the beginnings of a conversation that now are more prevalent about care of, of the people who are in the space um, but it was done in a very kind of visually like a, in a very kind of graphic design way um, and part of the reason of having this number of designers and, and this number of talents and this number of costumes was that when you play all the permutations on that, then nobody ever sees, no, no people, no person, no audience member ever sees the same thing. So you couldn't go there and say, oh, I, I saw that work. It's like, you, you got a little bit of it. If the work was six months long, then you saw, I don't know, a, a slight fraction of it. And I felt like I handed over the work to the performers because they were the ones that lived yeah. it. I was thinking about, I remember being really frustrated, especially after the, the ass and the Turner Prize, that the work was going quite viral. Well, there was a lot of Instagram about it, but I kind of appreciate at this point that the, uh, the best archive of this work exists there because it was the multiplicity of images of the work that existed. And it tells the story of how it was received. I think also, yeah, like, exactly. I think you have another image of the, like, all of the performers. Or, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the um, the seven different looks. And I had drawn them all up um, and then had asked, kind of approached Jonathan Anderson, the creative director at Loewe, who have since collaborated before and since have collaborated with a number of times and kind of kindly asked if they might consider helping make the costumes because I wanted them to look good you know I can I can get a leotard from Amazon and paint some stripes on it but that's not gonna that's not gonna impress anybody and I wanted you know it's almost like an armor for the for those people who are in the tape kept subject to the gaze of the audience like you know I wanted them to look their very best so these are kind of each one was kind of made to measure for the performers so they're kind of like these couture pieces um, and each of them were based on a, a different type of pumpkin or a different style of pumpkin, whether that be a carnival squash, um, the original image or something else, or just like a play of materials. Um, Amazing. And again, it just being another kind of um, invisible, invisibility within the work. Uh, and yes. I think, you know, this this relationship with, with them and the um, the... Is, is and Jonathan is kind of interesting in terms of like how it is what it's enabled in your practice I know that mm. like in, in later projects you've been able to realize things on a scale you wouldn't have been able to realize otherwise right yeah absolutely actually you I think you have the source image and the next slide if yeah. you wanted to go oh, yeah. no. uh, another collaboration but we can this, we can yeah. move on to that um yeah I think this is really um important so let's uh, get into this that so the yeah. original image as if you think about that Karl Lagerfeld image I was like going back and forth to the library all the time and I had um made a photocopy of the left hand image which mm -hmm. was and without not knowing it was by Eric Hawkins eight clear pieces at the time it was just something kind of as you kind of do that casual flick through um just kind of taking something and I think I was very much interested in um thinking about performance or how bodies can be in spaces and I think it spoke to all of that. And this middle image is a very favorite book of mine that I had as a child. And I think my work for all its complexity, I think if you asked me a few 
key questions you'd be like oh that unlocks it all it's like yeah the, the woman loves vegetables you know like um and I think this kind of <laughs> anthropomorphized Swede is that a rutabaga or is that something else anyway the Swede it's like um yeah maybe maybe it speaks to how I didn't see myself as a young black girl in books and so this was kind of like another space where it's like well I don't see this either so you know it's, it's about recognizing the, a lack somehow and so mm -hmm. there was a kind of a, a sense of this but also something missing from the image and we got all the way through the project all the way through the opening and then instantly after it opened um we were made as I say we that's myself and the tape were made aware that this image of Eric Hawkins was a direct kind of now we would say like appropriation of the Hopi squash kachina um mm -hmm. but you had yeah. never seen that that's kind of amazing that you know like uh, I suppose it came I suppose that's what Eric Hawkins did yeah and if you think he did that in the 60s and I think yes that idea of um I don't know if you think about like radical chic that idea of what being inclusive was then does not map onto how we would um frame inclusivity in these days in that maybe in the past it would have been wearing like a tasseled leather jacket that would kind of spoke to like indigenous clothing Whereas, oh, also if I, for him doing that, I think he, I am kind of paraphrasing, I did meet with the Eric Hawking's dance company, but that he was trying to like reshare something that he thought was overlooked yeah. or that was missing. But mm -hmm. when you look at it or feel it through a 2018 lens, then what you've got is um, a cult, like a kind of violent extractive cultural appropriation. Yeah. Um, and so I've also always felt, yeah, a sense of shame that I, I did that and I did that within the space of the Tate and but that none of us knew. I think we tried, it was like, oh, I tried to find the image, I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it. I remember doing like reverse Google searches and it offering me shoes and things like this. Like it was it the internet itself at that point algorithmically had no connection to the image because yeah. it still it understood me as a British woman of a certain age. Like it couldn't mm -hmm. be possible that I would be actually mm -hmm. looking. For that it was kind of like a I don't know a cositing that happens around like in the UK we don't we're only just starting to understand it now and I think should I I don't think it would have been possible to make this mistake if I was doing this project now and I also don't know if I would have done it either but um it's a fact mm. of the work um yeah I think acknowledging it now goes towards like at least you're aware and then like you know that shifts maybe how you look at the work right and I think um I think I was asked to do it because it had been like a hit shall we say I was asked to do it quite a few times afterwards and I always refused because I thought it's been kind of requested for its decorative qualities it's kind mm. of pop qualities um mm. but it was very a site specific and now I realize how site specific kind of uh project it was but I did redo it but it was on my terms so um because we're having such a nice chat, we're running a little at time, but I'm going to suggest we run over a little bit, um, if that's okay with you and with everyone else. And um, because there's some, I think I'd like to get to the end of the images that you've prepared. And then mm -hmm. there are a couple of questions in here, but um, just letting you know, we're going to run a bit longer. Um, this is this this is interesting because this is permanent. Mm -hmm. I think this is the first permanent work that I've done. I've often refused invitations to make proposals for permanent things um, because I felt like it would be what's the word being in cahoots with the city and I'm not uh -huh. necessarily sure that I am that person like I don't want to support what all that architecture does to us so I'm thinking of working in those kind of um, neoclassical spaces at the Tate you realize like what all of that architecture is about it's absolutely about power over people and so mm -hmm. doing things on buildings in London um, I'm not sure about I haven't quite got a full handle on that but this is at Studio Voltaire which is a very different space it's where I have my studio it's part of the artistic community that I'm in and it also then allowed me to kind of broaden absolutely but kind of um go deeper into the idea of if you think about where images come from but also where plants come from and you know mm -hmm. my parents both uh, came here as immigrants had a very different relationship to 
eating to growing and this very much speaks to an idea of a vernacular sense of how people who've traveled here use those kind of green spaces if they have access to them and it being very functional so everything in this garden is edible whether that's that Japanese acer right at the front to I don't know some geraniums some nasturtiums there's an apple tree but everything is everything is edible and everything's planted in a way in a non-decorative cottage garden kind of um it's planted in a very functional way but then I mean that may that makes sense right in terms not only of your practice but also because you're such a an important part of that community um studio Voltaire and it is very much an artist space so there's a kind of generosity to this project also it's not just a garden but it's like giving something back as well to that that building and that community Mm. I think I'm aware of that, you know, often there's a lot of performativity asked of artists, but like not just the work, but there's a sense of performing something, you know, very much when you make a performance or even when you're invited, it's like really, what, what's the question here? What's the actual invitation kind of requiring of me? And with this, I had a chance to think about, you know, you always think about that. And this was like another space, but in a slightly different yeah. way and that it's permanent. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's nice at the moment is everything's coming back to life here. So it, looks of very, it looks very different this kind of shows the shell of it and the kind of material decisions and the kind of the spatial that's blossoming yeah this is the bare bones in this way um okay. a, de- a detail but then this is the um i guess the mm. kind of one of the last kind of things to think about which is uh, a kind of mid-career survey that was held last year at the mucca uh, museum mm-hmm. of contemporary Art in antwerp and that was and I think seven. you know it brings it brings a lot of your work together but I think the you know we talked about these images struggling to con- struggling to represent the work mm. somehow the experience of it at least yeah yeah I think so um I think the space is a hundred meters long so I think that's like 300 odd feet long it's a very awkward space it was again it's a bit like take modern it's like a building that was a factory and then repurposed mm. so None of the decisions make sense in there. So it was very much a process of just shuffling all the walls slightly so that it could it could work on my terms. And um, the spaces are all really strange. Or I guess the idea of what you see or the, the acoustics of this space particularly was very difficult. And mm-hmm. that's not, it just kind of looks just quite pretty. So I guess I always do that, I kind of make something look a certain way, but the feel of it is something other like it's much more material like to hear your feet on those tiles in that room mm-hmm. very different to looking at it or when you see that this treatment has been applied to this space whereas another space is completely like a void then mm-hmm. that's um, significant yeah because it looks clinical but the experience of the work kind of isn't right mm-hmm. I hope so no I'm saying it isn't <laughs> it isn't but like I think there's a materiality to the experience but like it can yeah. I think when you don't somehow you need to see an occupy you see need to see the work activated occupied yeah. I think yeah. I've often thought what other kind of photographer could take pictures of the work that not there's like a language of the documentation of contemporary art which I'm kind of don't know how oh, I feel about yeah um just that kind of lens like I think an iPhone takes some more it's just a contemporary Mm. take on an image whereas Mm. uh, I think Mm. medium format camera doesn't quite do it I'm I'm happy with you know I'm grateful that I get to do it but it's also uh, I know that it wasn't quite this isn't quite what it is this is already like very edited um and maybe just with these pumpkins it jumps back to this is great yeah other photograph um, projects that were done with the support of Loewe um, and so there was the original proposal for the Davines and I think this is what I wanted some giant pumpkins always on the top of pumpkins sounds great to me but I couldn't really articulate it at the time um, but it was definitely an idea from 2017 to then materializing that and the realization of that in the Mukha 2022 and so maybe something's not clear from the images of those are all leather pumpkins they're mm-hmm. um, hand painted they're like you know very special handbags of objects in a way they're, they're very they're very tactile and they smell because they're leather there's like a lot going on with them like they're kind of padded they were made to feel like a muscle in an arm um mm-hmm. and then them kind of moving from a proposal to an institution to them becoming part of a fashion campaign um amazing which, 
uh, absurd to me but um, but it's great. interesting when we go right back to the beginning because it's like you've always played with um how images are constructed across different industries and so that's mm. somehow is yeah. continued true do you have what was the yeah there we go that's great um and then so much work comes together here in this image that we've discussed today yeah 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 I guess this was like all the sense of the sense of costumes that you've mentioned this idea mm -hmm. of a flatness or a 3dness or um and also playing with modes of display so this we thought about this and Claire the curator and I um we thought about this as like how you would show works in a fashion museum you know like mm -hmm. uh, which is different like an art museum this idea of like mm -hmm. staggered something quite playful or something quite um or sometimes quite awkward, you know, to say this kind of other way of placing things which don't adhere to the kind of standard rules of a contemporary art museum. And then, yeah, painting all the columns for just to create a, kind of a, a tie-in. Mm -hmm. And then this was like the central space, the gray zone where I painted, I actually was really thinking about the design galleries at the MoMA in New York mm. and how they're kind of staged and kind of following that, but then take, making the whole room the same color as the floor and kind of like making the whole room disappear. It's some kind of sense of an exhausting, an exa personal exhaustion as much as um, exhaustiveness of the works. And I think there were 70, 70 works um, in the show, or 70 loans and then um, several new commissions as well. Um, which I think including these to... sculptural objects I know that you were talking a lot about making and the materiality though it always somehow is there as well absolutely absolutely I think they I always come back to these kind of discrete objects to understand how to expand so like my studio is quite small considering the scale of the work and it's this idea of maybe that thing being of being back in the house I grew up in of having to project oneself into another space and everything kind of being proposal based like I don't need to work yeah. on a one -to one scale for that um this is just an example of trying to make an exhibition that like had nothing in it for a moment you know you can barely mm. see anything but in fact there's 70 pieces inside uh and then the difficulty of making, well, this is a, the executive's office. Um, like I don't really know what executives do. <laughs> Maybe no one knows what anyone does, but yeah, I especially don't know what executives do or just what it means to kind of be so in control and there being certain kind of stereotypes that I kind of assume go, to go with that. So as much as a kind of maybe a squash or a pumpkin is a sense of other, at the other end of the spectrum, I've placed the executive. Like, and But then everything's on an oblique angle. It's made with a kind of tartan pattern based on my surname. There's a wallpaper at the back based on a Ozu film that glows in the dark. So the whole show goes black and then this like kind of, kind of vertical moment in the show, which is just about the space. So yeah, there's kind of a lot of things going on. And then it was activated as this long trajectory, long kind of performance, kind of like a parade through the space of the performers there. And then the final space being uh, the hip hop mansion, of course, why not? But thinking about um, one thing, I'm really interested in how power kind of shifts, this idea of what power is, like moves through different parts of culture, like what becomes visible, like the kimono became like a powerful symbol because it was decided by a certain set of people that this was a hot object. Um, you know, like there was a certain sense of beauty that allows John Travolta to become a powerful image within culture. And I see now that hip hop is like the most powerful musical form. So yeah, what happens, what happens in a, in that space of that, you know, like what, what how come, what's happening? Like it's actually incredibly dominant and I'm kind of exploring all of those things, but thinking about this space is like maybe, um, mm -hmm. If you were an award-winning, like Grammy-winning, like hip-hop artist, maybe you've got that house with like a huge view with a window, um, and then you've got your your entourage there, which are my chefs who travel the world with me, um, or I leave them there as stand-ins or proxies for myself. Um, Wonderful. And that was the space also. But I feel like it is because often with the photography, you only take pictures of the objects, but for me, so much is about the void. But um, that's why. I don't know how I can do it, Amazing. but they're all the, all the same. I mean, congratulations. That's an enormous exhibition, a very complex one. I wish I'd had the chance to see it. I mean, these times have been difficult uh, with the, I noticed the dates on all of this work is like pandemic, post-pandemic dates, more difficult to yeah. travel to things. Um, 
but I think, you know, unless I think, um, have you got any more images in these slides or should we, there's one question in, in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the chat, but like I can, I think you did have, for now. Yeah, yeah, you could do. Think do you think, unless there's something else you'd like to add? Um, I can't remember. I think there was, it's, oh, it's this, well, literally on that point, I just said, yeah, in a way you never yeah, said it. Yeah. So this was a commission from uh, The Walker that was part of an exhibition called um, The Paradox of Stillness that was curated by Vincenzo de Bellis, um, which was very much looking about performance and painting. And then, yeah, it happened just as lockdown kind of came in, so it was postponed. I had the opportunity to meet the performers at one point, but not to ever see anything of it ever again. So this kind of very difficult experience of making a performance in a space where I didn't know. I think something that's usually very important for me is that I kind of get to be in the same space where the work or the people kind of activating the work can be so I can make decisions that support them. That's something that was so key for the squash or for the, the butt or, you know, like mm -hmm. all, the things, these, all of it, all these yeah. things are kind of proxies for me as that first video was. And so it's very important that I kind of understand the terms and conditions around the viewing of the work. Um, so this was done very remotely. This was a real Zoom based experience, um, but I think it was okay. And it's kind of, there's a slight reference to like a Mike Kelly work, but also to my own work, to a domestic space. It's kind of like a messy teenager's bedroom. <laughs> but this idea of these people being proxies for cabbages, like still in this kind of veg vegetable, vegetable zone. And this idea of when vegetables rebel and bolt and kind of take on their own, take on their own, desires for themselves um and that was the work and then uh it was then acquired by the institution afterwards so I love the idea great. that it gets to live on and maybe I'll get to see it another time and it's been an interesting process of passing down the knowledge of how the work should function to the new teachers of it as well the new experience yeah Fantastic. Mm. okay so I mean the, um the question in the chat is a very simple one and one I was going to ask you anyway which is what projects on the horizon for you ah and um what would you like to do next have i, have I stopped sharing now um i saw that I yeah like that's fine yeah what's on the horizon or what would you like to do next uh what's on the horizon they should be the same thing shouldn't they what's on the horizon what, what's well the horizon? not necessarily we have things on our horizon <laughs> we have to do not like rather than things we choose to do yeah i guess um there's several things there's several things coming up um one thing is that I'm starting to think more about garden spaces again. So there's a project based in a garden that's forthcoming. Um, there is um, a big new project that I'm working on um, and that's gonna be based in Paris. And that's this idea of like a, it's kind of like an, it, it's like a, a project, a performative project that will be across several venues. And so it, it's about kind of, this kind of folding or understanding of how that can be in each of those spaces. So it's not a repeat, it's not just like buskers turning up, but yeah, we kind of music based. So for that, I'm also trying to learn songwriting in the short amount of time as well. Like this idea of how you can kind of autobiographically lead something, but working with performers I've worked with before and also allowing it to be a structure to kind of bring in their own kind of biographies because they understand the space better than I do of Paris. I'm kind of a visitor. Um, what else is going on? Several institutional things also, but also spending a bit more time in the studio and slowing down and reconnecting with people because it didn't suit yeah. me, the pandemic at all. So I'm just kind of, you know, every time I keep thinking now it's better, but it, it's just kind of re-coming back. We're not there yet. We're still yeah. creeping out of this time, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 Um, not a detailed answer, but one of the same. Thank you. And then we have a question from Ruth Novacek. Hi, Ruth. I haven't seen you for so long. I just want to say hello. Um, I'm, she says, I'm interested in what you say about documentary photography and how it doesn't portray art projects very well. Or it struggles, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I guess you have to think back to like why photography is there or like what photography is meant to do. Like, I don't feel it's necessarily for information always, or, um, or I'm always thinking about the editor or who is missing from the image or, you know, just all, all the things that where information can slip away or get lost kind of ill willfully or non willfully. Um, and I think maybe it's because I really always think about those things. I'm aware that in the documentation of the work that it's it's happening already, you know, like there's no way 
you know, like if you go and see a show and there's just something that's um, evident in the pictures of the squashes, there's no other people in them. It's kind of yeah. seen as a kind of solo act when in fact the, the performer was often mobbed by people all around them. But, um, and kids running around, it was like a very kind of like dam dynamic environment, which is lacking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think maybe to convey the sense of what the performer's doing, that's why I select the pictures of where they're on their own. But the reality of it was something else. You're also missing the acoustics. The sound really bounces mm. around. In and the place. smell, well, which is important. Exactly. exactly. So I think it's just, I mean, yeah, it's not even about creating like a virtual version. It's maybe taking it back to writing and asking like a... I, I quite like the writing that often goes with fashion shows because they somehow manage to encapsulate things very quickly or perfume, people who write for perfumes and things like this. Mm -hmm. Understanding like the specificity of certain words in a certain way, which I don't think, I think images are just so powerful that you you can't help but unsee, you can't, you can't see other than what is there very well. I'm not sure if that's right, but yeah. You, know, you did. You don't did. Have Okay, so I'm gonna um, bring this to this wonderful conversation to a close. I just want to say thank you, Anthea. It's been such a pleasure and a privilege to talk with you. Um, you know, over the over, over this distance, um, I look forward to seeing everything that you do next. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We run over by 15 minutes so thank you for staying with us as well and um thank you Yale for this invitation to both Anthea and I to have this wonderful conversation it's been fun thank you very much <laughs>